can succeed in the field of violent crime. During the 1970s she first gained notoriety as the marijuana queen, and she went on to rule her own gang with an iron hand for two decades. A slender brunette partial to blue jeans, she was feared for her fearlessness, which was backed up with the gun she always kept within easy reach. Nene served prison terms for murder and drug dealing but kept returning home, where she ran a string of bakeries as a cover for various criminal activities, which included money laundering and disposing of stolen goods. Nene's career as a crime boss came to an end on the evening of March 1, 1987. As she emerged from a taxi and was about to enter her heavily fortified home, two men dressed in black and waiting in a car parked nearby, their faces covered by bandages, pumped a hail of bullets into her. They were thought to be rival drug dealers, although there were those who suspected police involvement in the killing. The new generation of drug traffickers has succeeded in shouldering aside the animal game kingpins. But at least the bankers enjoyed a veneer of respectability they had been able to purchase an asset that served them well until a single courageous judge in Rio de Janeiro decided that they should no longer be above the law. A handful of dedicated prosecutors had been trying to make a case against the bankers for eight years. By bribing policemen to destroy evidence and by taking advantage of the opportunities for delay inherent in the Brazilian legal system, the bankers had been able to delay the proceedings for what they hoped would be an indefinite period of time. However, the prosecution adopted the clever tactic of simplifying the case against them, and they had the bad luck to appear before Judge Denise Frostsart. On May 21, 1993, this no-nonsense jurist sentenced 14 of the heads of what the press was now calling the Zoo Mafia to six-year prison terms. The only comfort the defendants could take from the verdict was the Brazilians. That the charge of drug trafficking against them had to be dropped for lack of proof. Judge Frossard's action drew praise from Brazilians weary of seeing the crime and corruption everywhere about them go unpunished asterisk but when the press reported that the incarcerated bankers were living comfortably behind bars, with access to amenities such as cellular telephones and permission to hold parties and even go on temporary leave to visit relatives on the outside, doubts about how much things had really changed began to surface. The animal game racketeers were no longer untouchables, however, and the government would soon launch another strike against them. A bookkeeper who had worked for Castor de Andrade, the undisputed chief of the Zoo Mafia, tipped Judge Frossard off to the whereabouts of his employer's headquarters, and a police raid turned up five vaults containing logbooks and computer diskettes that not only confirmed widely held suspicions but also surprised even jaded observers. The seized documents recorded payments to government officials such as President Fernando Culler, the governor of the state of Rio de Janeiro, Rio's mayor, and numerous members of the law enforcement community, as well as prominent private citizens. F. There was also what prosecutors called evidence of a link between Andrade and narcotics traffickers in Cali, Colombia, which renewed suspicions that the bankers had been laundering drug money and were perhaps even facilitating the transit of Colombian cocaine to Europe and the United States. Asterisk the magazine Vija in a profile of Judge Frostsard, recounts an anecdote intended to put her in a positive light, but which is indicative of the persistence of traditional attitudes about violence. A man broke into her apartment with a gun and attempted to rob her. She managed to escape and at the same time locked him inside. The police arrested him, and she personally conducted the interrogation. When the suspect refused to confess, she took delight in kicking him in the testicles. If there was no proof that any of the recipients knew they were receiving money from Andrade, other than an admission, and an apology, from Herbert de Souza, an anti-hunger activist who had accepted money to help support a group fighting AIDS. The Culture of Brutality 253 the increase in criminal activity by highly organized groups as well as freelance lawbreakers has put a tremendous strain on Brazil's prison system, which was outdated and inadequate even before the current crisis. Today Brazil has 300 penal institutions built to hold 62,000 inmates but currently housing 130,000. Mirroring the treatment Brazilian society has always accorded lower class citizens who disrupt the social order, penitentiaries have traditionally dealt with inmates harshly. 
The sharp rise in the number of convicts sent to these institutions over the last two decades has led to an increase in the violence the penal system has inflicted on inmates, and this violence has in turn generated sporadic brutal responses by the prison population. Indeed, in 1972, just prior to the start of the current crime wave, a report by Ministry of Justice investigators detailed the woeful inadequacies of Brazil's prisons, which they found to be filthy, overcrowded, undermanned, and in effect training camps for crime. A year later the military regime announced it would allocate $16.6 .6 million for penal reform. This amount was but a tiny fraction of what the government was spending on its pharaonic projects, and this promise turned out to be yet another expression of noble intentions that would never come to fruition. In 1980 the Minister of Justice himself recognized the bleakness of the situation when he admitted that Brazil's penitentiaries were dumps for prisoners, where the individual is subject to the basest human degradation. But it was not until 1985, when the press disclosed the existence of a death lottery in a prison in Minas Gerais, that the dimensions of the prison crisis became evident. To protest the overcrowded conditions under which they were being held, inmates announced that they were staging a lottery. The leaders of this macabre movement had put together a list of fellow prisoners they deemed worthy of sacrifice. Each week they would draw the name of a winner, who would then be strangled with what the inmates referred to as a Teresa, a rope made of rags tied together. The killing would go on until their demands were. The Brazilians. Met. Fifteen convicts lost their lives in the lottery. The authorities transferred some prisoners to other facilities, but they could not solve the basic problem of overcrowding without massive expenditures of funds, which simply were not available. The culture of violence spawned by Brazil's penal system involves prison guards, inmates, and police. Guards often treat prisoners with extreme cruelty. Beatings are not uncommon, nor is solitary confinement for extended periods of time. Understaffing, low pay, and a general lack of education all contribute to the atmosphere of barbarity. The inmates commit all kinds of violence against one another, ranging from simple assaults to homosexual rape to murder. They are also brutal to hostages taken during revolts or attempts to escape asterisk whenever circumstances require the state police to intervene inside a prison, the force they apply is often unrestrained, and they may also exact steep retribution once order has been restored. Two final types of contemporary violence worth noting are private in nature. One occurs within the precincts of that most sacred of Brazilian institutions the family and is authored by husbands who intentionally injure or kill their wives. The other is indirectly self-inflicted, it results when Brazilians willingly engage in conduct that subjects them to the risk of serious harm. There has always been a riptide of violence in Brazilian family life, and it stems from the absolute authority vested in the figure of the patriarch, as well as from a strong tradition of machismo. These foundation stones of male domination have vested in husbands the right to beat, and, in some instances, maim or burn, their wives a common practice in rural areas, especially in the northeast, and in urban slums populated by migrants from the countryside. The privilege extends across social boundaries, although wife. Asterisk the most highly publicized hostage taking occurred in March of 1994, when inmates at a penitentiary in the state of Ceará seized the Cardinal of Fortaleza, D.O.M. Alofcio Lors Hyder, while he was visiting the institution as part of his efforts on behalf of human rights for prisoners. He was released, unharmed, after 20 hours of captivity. The Culture of Brutality 255 Beating in the upper and middle classes has been less frequently publicized asterisk. When a man kills his wife or his lover, he often escapes punishment by invoking the defense of honor, which makes male passion, inflamed by grave affronts to one's manhood, a valid excuse for murder. Under the Brazilian legal system, murder is the only crime that requires trial by jury, and juries have wide latitude to decide cases on the basis of their intuitive notions of justice. In wife-killing cases, defense attorneys can argue that their client killed to protect his dignity, which was sullied by the alleged misconduct of his wife, and juries will often acquit the accused on this ground. Moreover, 
If a man is found guilty and he is a first-time offender, usually the case when wife killing is involved, the judge may take the defendant's violent emotion into account in sentencing him, which often results in mild punishment. The defense of honor is traceable to the Portuguese input into Brazilianness. The saying jealous as a Portuguese dates back several centuries and perhaps stems from the Moorish tradition of making wives and daughters subservient to their husbands and fathers. Portuguese colonial law absolved a man who caught his wife in the act of adultery and killed her. Although the first penal code of the Brazilian Empire abolished this legal privilege, it not only remained a customary defense that could be used in murder trials, but over the years it was also stretched to protect men in situations other than in flagrante delicto adultery. Thus a husband might be exonerated for killing his wife when he merely suspected her of unfaithfulness. Brazilian jurisprudence equated defense of honor with self-defense. A husband could protect his male dignity with as much force as he might lawfully use to protect his own life from an imminent threat. In the late 1970s and early 1980s several highly publicized murder trials in Rio de Janeiro and Belo Horizonte produced acquittals based on the defense of honor. These outcomes not only. Asterisk even beauty queens are not exempt. A recent authorized biography has revealed that Martha Rocha, a Miss Brazil and the runner-up in the Miss Universe pageant in 1954, was badly battered by one of her husbands, a well-known millionaire. The Brazilians Outraged women throughout Brazil but also gave considerable impetus to the country's budding feminist movement. Adding fuel to the indignation were reports such as a newspaper crime survey that found that in 1980, 772 women were murdered by their husbands or lovers in Sao Paulo alone, and few perpetrators of these crimes of passion were ever punished. In 1991 the Superior Tribunal of Justice, Brazil's highest court in criminal and civil matters, reversed the acquittal of a husband accused of murdering his wife on the ground that the judgment was contrary to the facts presented and held that discovering a wife's adultery did not give a husband the same legal protections afforded a person whose own life was threatened. The decision was widely hailed, but on retrial the trial judge permitted the defense of honor to be invoked again, and once again the jury acquitted the defendant. This time, under the law, there could be no appeal. Feminists have had more success in changing the way law enforcement authorities deal with crimes against women. In 1985 the governor of the state of Sao Paulo set up the first division for the protection of women within the state police. Officers assigned to the division, often women, investigate complaints of violence against women and may bring criminal charges. Other states have set up similar units. As one activist for women's rights has noted, these new police entities not only combat crime but also its definition, changing the border of accepted slash non-accepted social behavior. It is clear that changes in the law and in law enforcement programs aimed at reducing violence against women can bring about incremental progress only, but they will not succeed in any meaningful way until deeply ingrained societal attitudes evolve. There is a direct correlation between the way the judicial system responds to social problems and values cherished by most Brazilians. Self-inflicted violence resulting from personal recklessness is certainly not peculiar to Brazil. Every nationality has its risk preferers, as economists like to call them, individuals with a keen taste for peril and a low concern for their own safety. Brazil, however, seems to have more of them than most. Examples abound. President Fernando Collor enhanced his popularity with the masses when he demonstrated his disdain for the culture of brutality. 257. Danger and engaged in highly publicized stunts such as piloting a jet fighter at more than the speed of sound and riding a motorcycle without a helmet at twice the legal speed limit. Daredevils lie on custom-made skateboards and descend at breakneck speed a two and a half mile stretch of highway that winds its way down the escarpment that lies between the city of Sao Paulo and the sea, a roadway so steep that only uphill vehicular traffic is allowed. Several of the nation's most cherished sports idols are professional race drivers. Emerson Fittipaldi, who won the 1993 Indianapolis 500, and Ayrton Senna, three-time world champion of Formula One auto racing asterisk are not only revered but imitated by ordinary Brazilian motorists.
the recklessness phenomenon crosses class lines. Young men from the favelas practice train surfing, the sport of balancing oneself atop a speeding train. More recently they have invented bus surfing, which involves standing on the roof of an express bus as it makes the non-stop run between Copacabana Beach and downtown Rio de Janeiro. Several elements of Brazilianness contribute to this devil-may-care attitude toward risk, a low regard for human life, a byproduct of slavery and a corollary of the institutionalization of extreme poverty in Brazil, the compulsion to assert one's machismo and individualism, and an adolescent mindset that fosters a feeling of invulnerability to harm. The disregard of risks to themselves has combined with a lack of concern about jeopardizing others to make Brazilians extremely dangerous when they take the will of a motor vehicle. As Albert Camus observed in a journal he kept during a 1949 visit, Brazilian drivers are either joyous madmen or icy sadists. Auto collisions claim the lives of more than 50,000 victims a year in Brazil. In the city of Sao Paulo alone, there are more than 450 accidents a day. A disdain for traffic laws, which are seldom enforced, contributes to the carnage. Persons responsible for accidents are rarely held accountable, either criminally or civilly, for the results of their wreck. Senna was killed in a crash during a race in Italy on April 30, 1994. The Brazilians. Lessness. Safety regulations aimed at promoting highway safety are also routinely ignored. Bus and truck drivers often work long hours without a break, in violation of rules designed to make certain that motorists remain alert, and exhaustion has resulted in a number of highway catastrophes. The aspect of violence that has most horrified observers both inside and outside Brazil is the systematic brutalization of young people on society's margin. Nowhere does the gap separating rhetoric and reality emerge more starkly than in the contrast between the guarantees afforded children by the 1988 constitution and the cold-blooded assassination of boys and girls who live on city streets. If there is anything that most vividly symbolizes the perversity of the contemporary wave of violence in Brazil, it is the way it has victimized children. The story is not a pleasant one, but it must be told. Chapter 10 Suffer the Little Children 7 and 1944 Gechelio Vargas presided over the festive inauguration slash of a broad thoroughfare named after him and linking Rio de Janeiro's downtown with the north zone of the city. A chorus of 30,000 children, conducted by world-class composer Hador Villalobos, raised angelic voices to celebrate the occasion, and had a clear view of the facade of the 18th century Church of Our Lady of Candelaria, from whose stately portals the mighty Avenida Presidente Vargas seemed to flow. Forty-nine years later, another group of children would participate in a noteworthy event in front of the picture postcard landmark. Instead of singing in a choir, they would play the role of murder victims, and their numbers would be added to the mounting body count of Brazilian children killed on the streets, a phenomenon that has badly marred the image of Brazil. Shortly after midnight on July 23, 1993, they were sleeping on cardboard mats near the entrance to the floodlit church when two unmarked cars approached. Six men emerged from the vehicles and began to question them. An argument ensued and the men drew their weapons, took aim at the heads of the boys, and fired. The execution-style slaying claimed five lives. Within a short time three other boys were slaughtered in front of the Museum of Modern Art, about a mile away, in all likelihood by the same assassins. The killing was done with cold-blooded efficiency, and the Rio de Janeiro police came under immediate suspicion. Although the incident provoked outraged headlines in newspapers around the globe and widespread revulsion within Brazil. The Brazilians. Itself, it also drew the approval of a number of Rio residents, who used police hotlines and radio call-in shows to heap praise on the work of the executioners. Indeed, a newspaper poll published shortly after the event disclosed that 16% of the city's population supported the killings. The Candelaria massacre was actually a rather prosaic event. In 1992, 424 children in the state of Rio de Janeiro were murdered, and during the first six months of 1993, 320 met the same fate. At the time of the incident in downtown Rio, 
it was estimated that every day four Brazilian children were homicide victims. In 1991 the Institute of Legal Medicine in the state of Pernambuco autopsied the remains of 79 youngsters, aged 10 to 17, who had been shot to death on the streets of Recife. About 80% of the bodies had been mutilated. The universe of street kids in Brazil breaks down into two categories, those who actually live on the streets and sleep on sidewalks, under viaducts, or in other sheltered locations, and those who sleep at home but roam the streets during the day. Some work, some play, some beg, some sniff glue, and some engage in criminal activity that ranges from petty theft to armed assault to an occasional murder. Life on the streets for these children carries with it a constant risk of physical harm. One source of danger for them is police violence. A worker for the Pastoral Commission for Minors, an organ of the Archdiocese of Sao Paulo, told of seeing a policeman push a youngster's face into a wall, the impact left the boy with a broken nose. He related the story of how railroad security guards who had caught an urchin illegally selling merchandise on a train hauled him outside and forced his feet onto the tracks, the boy lost his toes when they were crushed by a passing train. The police are supposed to deter crime, but in fact they cover it up, he charged. Adult criminals use the kids in a variety of jobs, and then the police use the kids as scapegoats. They make a show of roughing them up, to prove to the public that they are doing their job. A Sao Paulo attorney specializing in juvenile justice pointed out that official violence is seldom punished. The police are completely out of control, she claimed. For example, individuals not suffer the little children. 261. Connected with them may do the actual torturing of suspects inside a police station. It's impossible to trace these people. She described efforts to discover what had really happened to a 14-year-old whom the police had detained and whose body turned up a week later, the child's body had been perforated four times and buried under another name. This sort of thing happens all the time, she said ruefully. The official violence uniformed police perpetrate on street children pales in comparison to the handiwork of justice heroes, vigilantes, off-duty or retired policemen who engage in what some have called an extermination industry designed to reduce the numbers of youngsters suspected of engaging in criminal activity. These freelancers often torture their prey before killing them. Due process of law is the least of their concerns. Some observers have estimated that as many as half of the victims may have been totally innocent of even any suspicion of wrongdoing. Human rights advocates have alleged that some businessmen hurt financially by the high rate of crime have been underwriting the Justice Heroes a charge echoed in 1991 by the Federal Minister of Health. Street children must face other physical threats as well. Ordinary citizens upset by the crime wave sweeping Brazil have been known to vent their frustrations on youngsters. The archdiocese worker in Sao Paulo told of an incident in which an attorney caught and stomped on a 15-year-old who had tried to steal a watch from him. The boy vomited bile and died 15 minutes later. The attorney successfully defended himself against criminal charges. The violence aimed at street kids is in part a response to the violence perpetrated by the children, who are victimizers as well as victims. The cycle is a vicious one. Society brutalizes homeless boys and girls, who become brutal themselves. According to a Sao Paulo social worker, the police have used cigarette lighter fluid to set fire to children they have picked up in the PRA Carita de SE in the downtown area. In response, some of the children have taken it upon themselves to spray lighter fluid on passers-by at the PRA Carita and then have attempted to ignite it. It's their form of counter-terrorism, he observed. The mass media gives ample coverage to violent crime committed by children, with television often conveying images that the Brazilians pack a terrifying impact. For example, in July 1992 newscasts showed a videotape of three boys who looked to be no more than 12 years old surrounding an elderly man in downtown Rio. They first asked him for a match and then demanded money. A look of horror came on his face as they drew knives on him. At that point one of the assailants noticed that someone was filming them, and the trio fled. The old man had the equivalent of about 30 cents in his pocket at the time. 
What ratchets up public outrage against street urchins even higher is the cloak of impunity that protects children who kill, assault, and rob. The legal system does not brand them criminals but instead uses the more euphemistic term infratores, lawbreakers, and does not subject them to punishment. Under a statute enacted in 1990, a lawbreaker under 12 years of age is generally released into the custody of his family or a surrogate family. A lawbreaker over 12 will be sent to a state institution specially designed for adolescents. These facilities are so antiquated and overcrowded that there is constant pressure to release the wrongdoers as soon as possible, and children escape from them regularly asterisk. At this point it might be useful to place the violence perpetrated by and against street kids in a larger context, that of the sorry plight of all poor children in Brazil. The savage capitalism that fueled the Brazilian economy in the late 1960s and early 1970s took an especially harsh toll on the children of the families left behind in the country's rush to development, and the economic crisis of the 1980s made a bad situation much worse. In 1985, out of approximately 3.9 million children born in Brazil, about 320,000 died before reaching their fourth year, 246,000 did not survive their first year, and of these half perished during the first 30 days of life. A study released at the end of 1987 put it more starkly, every four minutes two children less than one year old die in Brazil. According to one estimate, proper preventive care could reduce by two-thirds the deaths of children below the age of five in Brazil. Asterisk it is ironic that young criminals enjoy the same impunity that has always cloaked the rich and powerful in Brazil. But there are no justice heroes or lynch mobs that take it upon themselves to inflict retribution on elite wrongdoers. Suffer the little children. 263. A 1992 study by the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics found that 15% of Brazilian children under the age of 5 showed signs of malnutrition. It also concluded that 32 million children under the age of 17 lived in poverty. This figure exceeds the entire population of Argentina or Canada. The great majority of poor children must work to support themselves and help their families. Indeed, a recent study has revealed that 8 million children work, they comprise 11.6% of the Brazilian workforce. An estimated 2.8 million young people between the ages of 10 and 14 are employed in violation of the 1988 Constitution, which solemnly proclaims that the minimum work age in Brazil is 14. Many of these young workers receive as little as one-third of what an adult would earn at the same job, and they are subject to a range of occupational hazards. With their small hands and dexterity, youngsters are considered especially suitable for work in the shoe and glass industries the latter subjecting children to high oven temperatures and constant noise of up to 193 decibels. The dangers of the workplace parallel the hazards many poor Brazilian children face at home, where beatings and sexual abuse are not uncommon. Of about 1,000 complaints of sexual assaults reported between 1988 and 1993 to a Sao Paulo state agency charged with protecting minors, more than 75% of the assaults were alleged to have been committed by relatives. Moreover, it is quite likely that most rapes within family units go unreported. There is a correlation between domestic violence perpetrated on minors and child prostitution in Brazil. A figure often cited posits that about half a million Brazilian girls are engaged in the life, as it is called. This figure is probably as exaggerated as the estimate of 2 million made in 1987 by UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, since reliable surveys have never been conducted. Yet the prevalence of the phenomenon cannot be denied, whatever the exact numbers may be. Poverty and antediluvian attitudes that make ostracism the penalty for loss of virginity before marriage also force young girls to sell their bodies. In Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, the seemingly inexhaustible supply of children has kept up with the demand for pretty babies. The Brazilians. Girls learn quickly never to admit to being more than 15 years old, lest they lose potential patrons. Many of them admire Madonna and imitate her as best they can. Boys learn to dress as girls or to adopt a macho swagger in order to attract homosexual clients. 
Given Brazil's current economic crisis, it is not surprising that many youngsters end up living on the streets. Yet the problem of homeless children in Brazil is not new. Among the reasons cited for child homelessness among the black and mulatto population has been the disruptive impact of slavery on black families and the dislocations brought about by abolition, when freed slaves were turned loose on their own in the countryside and later migrated to urban areas, inevitably left a number of young people to fend for themselves at an early age. One of the first to call national attention to the plight of the abandoned child was Jorge Amado, when he wrote Capitas de Araya, Captains of the Sand, a 1937 novel chronicling, and somewhat romanticizing, the adventures of a gang of youth surviving on the streets in the city of Salvador. Living in tiny shacks, physically abused by a drunken, frustrated father or by the uncaring man with whom their mother is living, forced to seek work and bring money home, many children understandably prefer to run away and fend for themselves on the streets. What compounds the contemporary dilemma of Brazil's lost children is that they are part of an ever-expanding pool of people without hope, a dehumanized subspecies that poses a critical threat to social stability. To capture the essence of the tragedy, one has to forget about the numbers and enter places such as the Vila Maria shelter in Sao Paulo and look at the faces of the street kids taking refuge there. The collective as well as the personalized misery encountered in Brazil's urban rookeries and rural backwaters may not shock the sensibilities of those accustomed to viewing Brazilian poverty, but even for veteran observers there is something very unsettling about the sight of youngsters who have been systematically brutalized by the society into which they have been born. In addition to the obvious fact that virtually all the children are black or brown, another visible legacy of slavery, what pro? Suffer the little children. 265. Dutze's a dramatic impression on the casual observer is the children's eyes darting, attentive, curious, and expressive. As Claudia, a worker at the Vila Maria shelter, explained it, observation is their stock in trade. They are keen students of human behavior. They need to know whom to steal from, who might grab them, who might be police. It's a matter of survival for them. When I visited the shelter, they watched me very carefully and wanted to know my identity. Told that I was an American writer, one of the boys approached and guilelessly asked to hear some English spoken. Another gave me a gift of some rosary beads. The truth painfully emerges, they are really children affectionate and affection starved, fragile, playful, innocent, capable of laughter and tears, smiling the irresistible Brazilian smile. Yet the same youngsters can be as dangerous as wild animals hard-eyed, tough, ruthless, explosive, vicious. Maria Teresa Mora, a social worker in Rio de Janeiro, described another aspect of street children's dichotomous existence. They mature by necessity and become adults very quickly. But many of them still sleep in the fetal position, often with their thumbs in their mouths. You can find them playing with toy cars like four-year-olds, but with cigarettes dangling from their lips. The distinctive personalities of the Vila Maria children became obvious even to the casual observer. There was the beautiful Claudine Ha, 13 years old and a heavy smoker, beginning to develop as a woman, wearing a lanyard around her forehead, curly-haired, scars disfiguring her face and chest. There was eight-year-old Paolo, Elfin, barefoot, blonde, and dark-skinned, his hands heavily bandaged. He had stolen a watch and then refused to sell it to an intruhau, an adult who handles pilfered property for the urchins. The latter responded by dousing the boy with gasoline and setting fire to him. As I watched Paolo, he aimed a playful kick at the groin of one of the counselors, and a playful swipe with a shard of broken glass. The counselors try to interact with the children on the children's own terms. For example, they respect the children's freedom the most cherished possession of street kids, something that they have fought to win and that is fundamental to their existence. The counselors also respect the strong sense of solidarity and sharing that develop among abandoned children, traits shared by Adu. The Brazilians. Lessened street gang members in the United States. They find themselves spending a great deal of time decoding the street vocabulary the youngsters use. 
A survey of a group of street kids produced some revealing answers. When asked what they were most afraid of, they named either someone in their family or something quite ordinary, such as cockroaches or cats. When asked what they would most like to do that they hadn't done before, the most common answer was that they would like to play, next on the list was to travel, to places like Japan. The lives of Brazil's street kids reflect a process of natural selection. Their experience suggests a cruel, if unintended experiment that confirms the tenets of social Darwinism. Lila Yanon, a Sao Paulo social worker and author, put it succinctly, the weak die early from disease and violence, the strong survive to adulthood. Those who do not shrink from the struggle develop a great deal of character, according to a worker for the Sao Paulo Archdiocese. They are conquering life and have a strong sense of dignity. They hate being pitted and will strongly object when anyone calls them abandoned children. Indeed, one of their cherished goals is to join the Brazilian mainstream. As a worker for the UNICEF in Brasilia noted, when they get a little money, they prefer to eat at Bob's a popular fast food chain because they see the TV ads for Bob's and want to be like everyone else. At the same time, they realize full well what society has done and is doing to them. As Maria Teresa Mora observed, they are aware of the process of their marginalization and clearly perceive how people are judging them. They know that they have no choice but to do what they are doing. In the words of one of the youngsters who attended a municipal encounter of street kids in 1987, nobody is born stealing. That these children regularly resort to drugs should be no surprise. The substance of choice is glue, easy to obtain, inexpensive, and potent. Sniffing it can have serious and irreversibly damaging effects on the brain. Participants at the 1987 encounter gave various explanations for their abuse of this substance, on the street you have to sniff glue, if you don't, you can't put up with this life. Suffer the little children. 267. Kids sniff glue and forget life, they see animated cartoons on the walls, they forget their hunger. Other factors influencing children to sniff glue include peer pressure, encouragement from the adults who purchase stolen goods from them and use them in other criminal activities, and no doubt a strong desire to make a statement of social protest. Glue sniffing produces a euphoria that fortifies the user's resolve to engage in criminal activity that might turn violent. Other substances that street kids abuse include ether, stain removers, fire extinguishing sprays, varnish, and gasoline. Some youngsters even smoke horse manure or inject into their feet a mixture of coffee and water. When they reach puberty, they often switch to using marijuana as a status symbol. Those who move on into organized crime end up using cocaine. At the Vila Maria shelter, counselors encourage the children to draw and talk about the realms they inhabit while under the influence of drugs. Voyages to stars, comets, and satellites obvious reflections of the children's earthly discontents were the most popular fantasies. The impact of society's institutions on these young people is seldom positive and often negative. The public school system, for example, cannot deal with them. The educational system in Brazil is hardly suitable for street kids, commented Maria Cecilia Ziliato, the Sao Paulo representative of the National Foundation for the Well-Being of Minors. It's not very good to begin with, and poor children need a great deal of attention, because they get no help at home. Instead, the schools give them even less than they give middle-class youngsters, and in the end they expel the street kids. As a Vila Maria counselor put it, the street kids are not accepted in the public schools. They come from an entirely different reality and have nothing in common with their classmates. One set of public entities that does directly touch the lives of underprivileged children is the complex web of federal and state institutions created both to protect the welfare of needy minors and to deal with lawbreakers under the age of 18, who by law cannot be held criminally responsible for their misdeeds. Over time, as the poverty of children and the violence perpetrated by and the Brazilians against them have grown, the government has proven incapable of recognizing and remedying the complex web of social ills that are to blame for the sad existences of street children in Brazil.
During the colonial period and up to 1889, when Brazil abolished its monarchy and became a republic, it was thought to be the job of the churches to take care of abandoned and orphaned children. As Brazil cities grew more populated and crime increased, the elected governments that ruled the country in the first three decades of the 20th century took the position that urban violence was a matter for the police to deal with and repress. Thus, institutions were created to control and punish delinquent children. It was not until the authoritarian regime of Gechelio Vargas that social problems were recognized as such. As a result of the new policies developed to confront these problems the service of assistance to the minor, SAM, was created. As a department within the Federal Ministry of Justice, it was designed to foster the vocational rehabilitation of youngsters who ended up in detention centers. But a lack of adequate funding and staffing, a spate of corruption, and the physical mistreatment of children by officials and guards earned for facilities operated by the SAMA deserved reputation as branch offices of hell and crime schools. The military regime that seized power in 1964 adopted what it proclaimed to be a new priority for poor and delinquent children. It abolished the SAM and in its place established the National Foundation for the Well-Being of the Minor, FUNABEM. State governments created similar agencies, called FEBEMs, State Foundations for the Well-Being of the Minor. The responsibilities delegated to FUNABEM included the dispensing of federal funds to state entities, such as Sao Paulo's FIBEM, and the actual day-to-day -day administration of detention centers in the city of Rio de Janeiro, a seemingly anachronistic function dating back to the days when Rio was the capital of Brazil. Despite its efforts to substitute programs assisting children for those that had been trying to punish and control them, despite the organizational changes it made, the military regime did not bring about any significant improvements. The Funabem-run facilities often tried to instill a military-like discipline in their charges, who suffer the little children. 269. Just as often resisted. As economic indicators plunged and the crime rate soared, there was an increase in the use of minors by adults in the commission of serious crimes, which occasionally included murder. The young people whom the police caught were committed to Funabem or Febum facilities, which often had to release them after a short time because of overcrowding. The mass media in Brazil seized the opportunity to sensationalize the exploits of juvenile criminals, virtually all of whom were identified as alumni of Funabem or the various FEBEMs. One of the most notorious was 16-year-old Reinaldo Moreno, popularly known as Naldin Ho, a frequent fugitive from the Sao Paulo FEBEM, who was accused of robbery and murder. The newspapers made him into a sort of super bandit, and he became a symbol for those who advocated a hard line on juvenile crime. The Sao Paulo police made his recapture a matter of pride. The boy's body, riddled with bullets, eventually turned up in Rio de Janeiro. The circumstances of his death were never clarified, but rumors implicated law enforcement officials from Sao Paulo. The great majority of young people passing through these institutions had never committed any violent crimes. Often the police picked them up for vagrancy or begging. Christmas and Carnival are regular occasions when the police sweep minors from city streets. According to Maria Ignace Bierenbach, a former director of the Sao Paulo FIBUM, judges often brand as lawbreakers children picked up for vagrancy and brought before them several times, and then they commit them to FIBUM. The stigma that the children then carry makes their integration into the community very difficult. In 1981 the FIBUM in Sao Paulo gained worldwide notoriety as the setting for Pixoti, Hector Babenko's prize-winning, gut-wrenching cinematic depiction of the fate of a group of young boys who are committed to a reformatory, escape, and lead a life of crime in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. The harshness of life in the closed society of the institution mirrors the brutality of the outside world, where the title character, a ten-year-old, snatches purses, deals dope, robs a prostitute's customers, and eventually commits murder. With the transition to democracy in 1984, Efforts were undertaken to ameliorate conditions in the Sao Paulo FIBUM. One goal of the Brazilians. 
the newly elected state government was to eliminate abusive practices on the part of FIBAM employees who were known to be routinely inflicting physical violence on minors. More ambitious plans sought to change FIBAM's paternalistic, assistance-oriented approach and to create a system that would respect the rights of the children as human beings and citizens. The bureaucracy resisted. Guards who wanted to maintain within FIBUM the authoritarian structure of the society beyond the institution's walls complained that the young inmates were given too much freedom. Moreover, the guards pointed out that the social services FIBUM was now providing for its charges exceeded what society made available to the children of FIBUM guards and functionaries, who were poorly paid for difficult, thankless jobs. Their discontent infected the entire enterprise. For nearly two years unrest plagued the large FIBUM facility in Balem, one of Sao Paulo's grey industrial, working-class districts near the Teat River. Drugs and weapons found their way inside, and young prisoners fashioned guns from dark wood and even soap bars. Mutinies and escapes were frequent, the latter occasionally abetted by friends from outside who boldly invaded the confines of the quadrilateral, as the complex is called. An ex internee shot and killed a FIBUM inspector at the institution's gate. A youthful inmate hanged himself. The inevitable explosion occurred in February of 1986, when a series of riots rocked the facility. Shock troops from the state police eventually entered and used brute force to subdue the young rebels, some of whom were carrying knives, clubs, and stones. But the children managed to reduce to charge shambles the pavilions that housed them. Until recently, no effort was made to segregate detainees according to the gravity of the crimes they were charged with. A worker at a Funabem facility in Rio de Janeiro, where juvenile offenders of all types are housed at random, underscored the senselessness of such an arrangement. We mix hardcore criminals with kids who are in here for stealing oranges. ELE pointed out a shy 14-year-old who had been sent to the institution for getting into a fight in school, and he then described another boy in the same group of inmates. He was part of a gang which held up a Suffer the little children. 271. Taxi driver, shot him in the head, but didn't kill him, dragged him from the cab, slit open his stomach, put rocks in, and then threw him in a river. Indeed, the violent crimes attributed to youthful offenders strain the imagination. In the isolation ward of the Sao Paulo Fabem, which houses boys who are ill, subject to discipline, or kept apart for their own protection, rapists, for example, run the risk of dire physical retribution from their peers, two black teenagers share a cell. The 17-year-old sits on a bench, doubled over from the injuries he sustained during a barroom brawl, which had aggravated a bullet wound in the spine he had previously suffered at the hands of the police. He is surprisingly articulate and occasionally flashes a fetching grin. He says it pains him to stand erect. The 16-year-old, handsome and well-built, is recovering from a bullet wound in the thigh he sustained during a hold-up in which he claims not to have been participating. They admit to having killed seven people between them, and each with quiet pride demonstrates the various bullet and knife scars his body bears. Each has been in and out of the quadrilateral on at least eight occasions an indication of the revolving door nature of juvenile justice in Brazil. What strikes me most as I listen to them is that they betray no feeling at all for the crimes they say they have committed, and they project a completely antisocial attitude. One of the monitors points out that although the law prevents these boys from being punished, the police in Sao Paulo know who they are and what they have done, they will be eternal suspects and will constantly be subject to police harassment. Thus even if the two turned their lives around and no longer committed crimes, the police would continue to watch and question them. The 17-year-old speaks bitterly, in a soft voice. There are worse people than us on the outside, but the police don't arrest them because they have money, social position, family, lawyers. Only the poor come to Febum. This is the sorry truth that the miners in these institutions learn merely by looking around. When scions of wealthy or even middle class families run afoul of the law, they are normally released into the custody of their parents, who promise to procure for them sight. The Brazilians. Ecological or Psychiatric Treatment. As a FIBA monitor remarked, 
Statistically speaking, juvenile delinquency on the part of the rich doesn't exist in Brazil. In some small ways detainees actually benefit from their stays. The average weight they gain during the first month at the Sao Paulo Febum is from 6 to 13 pounds. Many for the first time learn rudimentary hygiene, such as how to use a toothbrush, and the basics of preventive medicine. They also receive medical and dental care. At the well-equipped, well-scrubbed Funabem Hospital in Quintino, on the outskirts of the city of Rio de Janeiro, Dr. Carlos Jose Carvalho pointed out that malnutrition and infectious diseases are the most common ailments afflicting institutionalized minors. Of much greater concern to him was that as of December 1987 11 young patients at the hospital had been diagnosed as suffering from AIDS, apparently contracted through sexual contact and the use of contaminated hypodermic needles. The state government of Sao Paulo has been taking additional steps to improve its programs for poor and delinquent children. The youth administration now supervises all these programs, and it has initiated a number of reforms. For example, a new entity called SOS Children takes in lost or abandoned youngsters, handles complaints of violence against children, and does the initial screening of minors accused of breaking the law. Only those suspected of committing serious offenses are sent to a nearby Febum facility. The administration also operates open houses and shelters for street kids. As hopelessly grim as the plight of poor, abandoned, and delinquent children may be, concerned private citizens are struggling with the problem on many levels. The courage, persistence, and indomitability of many of these children offer slender rays of hope that a small percentage of them may be salvaged from society's scrap heap. There is currently a vast array of social programs for street kids, and they take varying approaches to the problem. Some, like the movement of street boys and girls, are primarily political and seek to influence government officials and legislators. Others are solo. Suffer the little children. 273. Efforts, such as that of an Air Force non-commissioned officer who uses facilities at the airbase at Galeo in Rio de Janeiro to provide activities for impoverished youngsters. Still others are more elaborate, such as the former municipal slaughterhouse that has been converted into a center for the education and training of 350 street kids in Curitiba. Some corporations are beginning to involve themselves in efforts to help bring these youngsters back into the societal fold. The work of a dynamic, dedicated, courageous lawyer named Ana Vasconcelos typifies the efforts of individual Brazilians. Her project in Recife targets a generally neglected aspect of the tragedy of Brazil's underprivileged children the plight of street girls. People never look at these girls as workers, the way they might perceive boys on the street, Anna has observed. The girls are seen and treated as sexual objects. The pressure to engage in prostitution overwhelms them. It is very easy for them to earn money by selling their bodies. So far three girls here have died from AIDS. We try to give them some sex education and we provide them with condoms, but the adults who patronize them don't want them to use contraceptives. It's a cultural thing. Sperm is considered an instrument of male domination, and the use of a condom is viewed as a form of rejection. There have been instances of girls getting killed for insisting on wearing them. The street boys also exploit the girls. They use them to do errands, have sex with them, and physically abuse them. The fantasy of these girls is to find a boy who will love them. The girls live a life of permanent violence. They use razor blades to defend themselves. Sometimes they cut themselves as a form of self-flagellation. For them there is a very thin line between love and hate. The church, the rural tradition from which most of them come indeed, Brazilian society as a whole fills these girls with a sense of guilt. Our job is to try to instill some dignity and self-worth into them. Anna's project, called the House of Passage, is just off the Conde de Boa Vista Avenue in downtown Recife. The building is old and somewhat dilapidated, but Anna and her co-workers have. The Brazilians. Made great efforts to turn it into a refuge where the girls can come and go as they please. The House of Passage offers them meals, a locker where they can store their meager possessions, 
and classes providing rudimentary education and certain job skills. Friday is cleanup day, and a number of the girls assist with the chores. They are mostly black or mulatto. Several are pregnant. Two are sleeping in a stairwell under a piece of canvas, still feeling the effects of the glue they sniffed on the previous night. Anna drives off with one of the pregnant girls, a 15-year-old mulatta with beautiful gray eyes. Sessa lives with her mother and her two children on the sidewalk in front of the downtown church of São Francisco. Sessa's mother rents out her grandchildren to a beggar for 50% of the children's daily take. Anna is trying to help Sessa negotiate with her mother so that Sessa will be permitted to care for her third child herself. The challenge of working with Recifa street girls is severely testing Anna. Every day the problem gets worse, she says. All we can do is try to help them survive the reality of their daily lives. Asterisk. If there is one person who symbolizes the marginalized minor in Brazil, perhaps it is Fernando Ramos da Silva. Born into an impoverished family in Diadema, a working-class suburb of Sao Paulo, Fernando was 12 years old when he had the good fortune to land a title role in Pixote. The film was a great success, and his performance gained high praise. In the words of New York Times reviewer Vincent Canby, Fernando has one of the most eloquent faces ever seen on the screen. It's not actually bruised, but it looks battered. The eyes don't match, as if one eye were attending to immediate events and the other were considering escape routes. It's a face full of life and expression. At the conclusion of the film, the diminutive Pixote is cruelly rejected by the prostitute with whom he has been working. He Asterisk the daughter of a sugar mill owner in the interior of Pernambuco, Anna has always had a fiercely independent spirit. As a child she ran away several times with itinerant gypsies, my father would always come to the next town to fetch me, and the local prostitutes fascinated her, they were strong women and they were free. Suffer the little children. 275. Picks up his gun and leaves. The final scene shows him walking by himself along some railroad tracks. For Fernando Ramos da Silva, life and art were interchangeable. Few acting roles came his way after Pixote, and he had to return, jobless, to Diadema. Eventually he made the news again. The police arrested him for burglary and later for carrying a weapon. In 1987 they shot him to death during what they said was a robbery he was committing. He was 19. Chapter 11. Abusing Nature's Bounty. T. He press customarily referred to Cubatao as the Valley of Death, the most polluted place on Earth, or Brazil's Minamata. Asterisk. For some the city was a symbol of the violence Brazilians had been willing to inflict on themselves in the name of progress. For others it represented the fruits of savage capitalism at its worst. Since Brazilians like to poke fun at everything, there was even a popular song describing the varied forms of pollution one could sample during a honeymoon in Cubatao, and a Rio punk nightclub called Cubatao Dusk. The working class residents of this industrial complex 35 miles from the city of Sao Paulo have had the sorry distinction of living in a chemical laboratory where they serve as test animals for what has turned out to be an experiment to determine both the long and short term effects of air and water pollutants on humans. According to measurements taken in 1980 by a government agency, Every day the factories of Cubatao were discharging 10,000 tons of toxic gases and particulate matter into the atmosphere. In one slum neighborhood the level of air contamination was twice what the World Health Organization considered capable of producing excess mortality. In 1977 a device installed there by the state government to measure pollutants in the air broke down after 18 months because it was strained beyond. Asterisk between 1932 and 1968 a company dumped tons of mercury into the ocean off the southern coast of Japan near the village of Minamata, a bountiful fishing area. The poison took a thousand lives and inflicted serious illness on thousands more. Abusing Nature's Bounty 277. Its Capacity Moreover, the levels of acid rain in Cubatao exceeded those to be found anywhere on the planet. 
The 1980 investigation found that on a daily basis industrial plants were dumping 2,600 tons of poisonous wastes into adjacent rivers, which were all certifiably lifeless. Detergent foam, clouds of steam, and green sludge were the signature elements of Cubatayo's waterways, which ceaselessly disgorged deformed, dead fish and assorted foul sten CHES. The effects of this ecological violence on the nearly 100,000 citizens of Cubatayo were predictably disastrous. The incidences of birth defects were said to exceed those to be found elsewhere in the country, and unconfirmed reports of gruesomely deformed infants babies born without brains, and kittens born without limbs added to Cubatayo's disrepute. The city had Brazil's highest infant mortality rate. As many as half of the city's inhabitants were believed to be suffering from some form of lung disease. The story of the ruin of Cubatayo involves elephantine miscalculation, which may be attributed to a number of uniquely Brazilian tendencies. Indifference to risk, especially as it might affect people on the lower end of the social scale, obviously was a factor. This same attitude has made Brazil a leading importer of dangerous pesticides. The primary victims of these agrochemicals are the farm workers who are constantly exposed to them, the primary beneficiaries are the multinational companies that dump in Brazil products banned in first world countries, or that sell chemicals in Brazil under circumstances in which proper warnings are not given to those who will use them. Other elements contributing to the misjudgment include an unblinking embrace of modernism, without regard for its possible adverse consequences, a mindset also conducive to the indiscriminate use of supposedly state-of-the-art pesticides manufactured abroad. According to José Lutzenberger, a pioneer in Brazil's environmental movement, his compatriots equate nature with backwardness. What happened in Cubatayo mirrored developments in other parts of the country, where there were abundant signs that Brazilians were well on their way toward destroying their tropical Eden. One example is the fate of the 140-square-mile Guanabara. The Brazilians. Bay, which provides a spectacular setting for Rio de Janeiro. There was a time when much of Rio's social life centered on the bay, whose waters welcomed swimmers, boaters, and fishermen. Today it is a cesspool, a receptacle for the raw sewage discharged from heavily populated slums, and for waste originating in shipyards and nearby factories. The rivers that flow into the bay add more pollutants to the mix of toxic substances. A scenic backdrop that at one time inspired lyrical prose from travelers arriving in Rio by ship asterisk now repels visitors and residents alike. Cubatayo was once a collection of mangrove swamps intersected by rivers and inlets from the nearby sea. During the early years of the captaincy of São Vicente, the need to secure a trail connecting the port of Santos with the highland trading post of São Paulo led to the founding of a small settlement on the bank of the Cubatayo River. Canoes brought passengers and freight from the port of Santos to Cubatayo, where horses or mules provided transport up the steep escarpment to São Paulo. By the end of the 18th century, the shipment of sugar cane from Sao Paulo down to the sea had reached such a high volume that the government responded by constructing a new road between Sao Paulo and Santos. In 1833 Cubatayo attained the legal status of a municipality. But prosperity proved elusive. The Santos Lowlands, as the entire region was called, was a breeding ground for a range of debilitating diseases, and although tropical vegetation was abundant, the soil was ill-suited for agriculture. When the completion of the São Paulo-Santos railroad line in 1867, a remarkable engineering feat, cut the need for intermediate transport facilities, such as inns and posts where fresh horses could be obtained, Cubatago entered a period of decline. But at the turn of the century, the swamps between the coast and the mountains were finally drained. The urgent need for a sanitation campaign had been dramatized by a yellow fever plague that once left more than 40 British ships adrift, their crews dead or asterisk when Cole Porter, his wife, and actor Monty Woolley approached Rio by ship at dawn and gazed at the view of the city. Porter remarked, it's delightful. His wife added, it's delicious. Not to be outdone, Woolley chimed in with, it's de lovely. The latter phrase provided Porter with a title for one of his best songs. Abusing Nature's Bounty. 279. 
dying, in the river upon which the port of Santos is located. By the end of World War I, the Santos lowlands became a center of banana cultivation and soon was producing more bananas than any other agricultural area of Brazil. Indeed, there was an idyllic quality about the place. Zelia Gattai, the wife of Jorge Amado, in her charming memoir Anarquistas, Gramas a Deus, Anarchists, thank God, described her first impression of the area, there was kilometer after kilometer of banana trees implanted on humid terrain. I admired the size of the bunches of bananas, immense, almost lying against the ground, held up by dwarf-like trees. For French anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, who passed by Cuba Batao in 1935, the region was an inundated plain, variegated with lagoons and marshes and crisscrossed by innumerable rivers, straits, and canals, the pattern of which is perpetually blurred by a pearly vapor, a place that seems like the earth itself, emerging on the first day of creation. Up to the early 1950s Cuba Batao had experienced a very modest degree of industrialization, with the construction of a paper plant and a tannery in the second decade of the century. But then the supply of power available to Cuba Batao increased sharply because of improvements in the flow of water down from a reservoir on the plateau above the town. This development set the stage for a great leap forward into catastrophe. From a purely rational point of view, any proposal to install an industrial complex in Cuba Batao should have been adjudged sheer madness and dismissed out of hand. If there was any spot on this earth where factories should not have been located, it was on these steamy, rain-drenched lowlands tucked against the foot of an escarpment that blocked prevailing winds blowing in from the nearby ocean. But with the advent of the Cubits Czech era of giddy growth, all that mattered were Cubatayo's proximity to the megalopolis of Sao Paulo and to Santos, the largest port in South America, and its access to a bountiful supply of energy. In 1955 Petrobras, the state oil company, set up a refinery in Cubatayo. In rapid succession, a steel mill and plants manufacturing fertilizer, cement, and an array of petrochemicals sprouted chimneys and opened their gates. All in all, some 25 Brazilian and multinational companies. The Brazilians. Came to Cubatayo, turning the municipality into one of the continent's largest manufacturing complexes, accounting for 16% of the total output of Brazilian industry. The only drawback of all this productivity was that human beings had to operate these factories and live near them. Laborers, many of them from the northeast, made their way to Cubatayo to provide the manpower for the new plants. They erected favelas and installed their families next to these workplaces. Neither the companies nor the government did anything to prevent the settlement of the area. The worst of these slums, called Vila Parisi, was at one time home to 15,000 people. Hemmed in on three sides by smoke spewing stacks, the shanties of Vila Parisi suffered a constant bombardment of toxic pollutants. Moreover, these ramshackle structures roosted on land 18 inches below sea level. High tides regularly caused flooding, which swept the contents of open sewers through the muddy streets of the settlement. In some, the decision to locate an industrial complex in Cubatayo evidenced a total lack of regard for even the most basic environmental considerations. But in the 1950s and 1960s, third world countries were wont to ignore suspected or confirmed hazards in order to set themselves firmly on the path to development. Brazil, with customary exuberance, put itself in the vanguard of the ecologically indifferent. During the 1970s, ecology appeared on the agendas of many nations of the first world. The Brazilian response, as typified by remarks made by the Minister of Planning in 1972, was that Brazil can become the importer of pollution. He was suggesting that foreign companies restricted by environmental legislation in their homelands might consider relocating to Brazil. They would be able to ship to Brazil plants with machinery made obsolete by technology that anti-pollution laws in their countries had forced to be developed. It was an attractive proposition. Why not? The New York Times quoted the minister as asking. We have a lot left to pollute. The Brazilians reiterated their commitment to development, regardless of its consequences, 
at the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm. The potentially serious human health risks posed by air and water contamination did not weigh heavily on the minds of Bra. Abusing Nature's Bounty 281. Zill's policymakers, who dismissed environmental concerns, insisting that the poverty caused by underdevelopment was a greater social hazard than any effects of pollution. They ignored a 1970 study by the municipal government of Cubatayo documenting the range of illnesses reported by residents and attributed to atmospheric contaminants. The first reported case of illness dated back to 1957. The march toward industrialization proceeded apace. The fact that the victims were primarily ill-paid workers and their families undoubtedly influenced this attitude of malign neglect. The value of life at the low end of the social spectrum in Brazil has never been high. In part this is one of the legacies of slavery. This attitude also proceeds from a long tradition of authoritarianism that has inculcated in the lower classes an attitude of submission to whatever lot their superiors assign to them. The residents of Cubatayo were forced to pay a high price for the progress Brazil achieved from the output of the factories installed in the Valley of Death. Brazil gave very little in return for the sacrifices these people made. Nor did residents have an opportunity to speak out about what was happening to them. In 1968 the military regime designated Cubatayo a national security zone, which meant that the federal government would appoint its mayor, and that the inhabitants of the city could not even exercise the limited rights of self-government other citizens enjoyed during the years of the dictatorship. The silent violence of environmental pollutants was not the only danger the townspeople faced. In 1984 a pipeline carrying diesel oil from Santos to the Petrobras refinery in Cubatayo ruptured and exploded. The resulting fire spread rapidly to the nearby favela of Vila Soco, a conglomeration of wooden shacks perched on stilts rising out of a swamp. The police claimed that as many as 100 people may have perished in the inferno. Unofficial sources put the fatality toll at between 600 and 900. Human beings were not the only casualties in the valley of death. Like a giant eraser, air pollution wiped out vegetation on the slopes of the plateau rising above Cubatayo. Since there were no roots to anchor the earth, heavy rains would inevitably bring erosion, and with it the grim prospect that landslides might bury favelas. The Brazilians the story of Cubatayo is not atypical of Brazil. The carelessness Brazilians have always displayed toward themselves also extends to their attitude toward the environment. As irresponsible as the choice of Cubatayo as the site for an industrial complex appears in retrospect, it was no less dubious than the decision to construct Brazil's first nuclear power plant in Angra dos Reis. The reactor sits on a narrow strip of coastal land 75 miles south of Rio de Janeiro, near an earthquake fault line and at a point where the Serra do Mar mountain range rises almost directly above the shore. Seasonal rains produce mudslides that often block or tear away the seaboard highway, a condition that would prevent the rapid evacuation of the nearby city in the event of a nuclear accident. Brazilians live in the midst of such abundance that many have come to believe that theirs is an infinite country with unlimited wealth. They extract as much as they can and destroy as they please, showing no concern for what they are leaving behind for their children and grandchildren. Their almost total destruction of the forest that once covered the country's Atlantic seaboard is only one example. It is almost as though they do not view themselves as permanent residents. As the 20th century draws to a close, the consequences of these attitudes are becoming all too apparent. One of the first Brazilians to sound an ecological warning that reached a mass audience was Ignacio de Loyola Brandeo. His successful 1982 novel Now Veris Pays Ninham, translated into English under the title And Still the Earth, conjures up a nightmarish vision of a Sao Paulo to come, parched, haze-shrouded, stifling, overcrowded, garbage-strewn, crime-ridden, and segregated by social class. As Loyola later revealed in a videotaped lecture, the inspiration for the book came from an incident in his neighborhood involving the mysterious, sudden death of a beautiful tree. After conducting an investigation, authorities discovered that one of the neighbors had poisoned it. When asked why she had done it, 
the woman explained that the tree's yellow flowers fell on and stained the sidewalk in front of her home. This utter lack of consciousness about the natural environment got Loyola started on a futuristic novel that, as he pointed out in a 1986 interview, is no longer futuristic. KKK. Abusing Nature's Bounty. 283. The Sao Paulo of the 1990s has yet to attain the degree of unlivability Loyola's book portrays, but the city gives every indication of edging in that direction. With 17 million inhabitants in its metropolitan area and a population of more than 21 million projected for the year 2000, Brazil's mightiest city shows the effects of a long period of uncontrolled, explosive growth that presently strains municipal services to the breaking point, poses serious health hazards, and adversely affects the quality of life for all of the city's residents. On first seeing Sao Paulo, one is immediately struck by its overwhelming size. At certain locations one can make a 360-degree scan and see imposing clusters of high-rises extending to the horizon in every direction. At most hours of the day and evening the elevated highways that crisscross the city groan under eight lanes of solid traffic either hurtling at high speeds or impatiently lurching forward in fits and starts. What makes Sao Paulo even more bewildering to the visitor is the absence of any touristic landmark to lend the city a picture postcard identity. One finds no Empire State Building, Eiffel Tower, or Sugar Loaf Mountain. In a sense, there is no there there. Instead the city of more than 500 square miles is one vast beehive, a center of serious enterprise, the capital of an enormously productive state fond of describing itself as the locomotive that pulls the rest of the country. Founded as a Jesuit missionary outpost in 1554, the town of Sao Paulo emerged as an economic power at the dawn of the 20th century because the soil and climate of the surrounding area proved particularly favorable to the cultivation of coffee trees. Between 1906 and 1910 Brazil's production of coffee reached 78% of the world's total. The boom attracted to Sao Paulo a flood of settlers from abroad. Between 1890 and 1920, an influx of foreigners into the state, and their subsequent migration to the city, tripled the state's population and increased the city's by nearly tenfold. Some of the wealth generated by the coffee boom was invested in the creation of small enterprises in and around Sao Paulo during the period between 1870 and 1920. The city had always been receptive to progressive ideas and exuded a dynamism, as well as the Brazilians. A strong independent streak, that could be traced back to the heyday of the Bandeirantes. Its location was particularly favorable to industrial development. A network of railways and roads linked it to the port of Santos, to the interior of the state, and to Rio de Janeiro to the north. Raw materials were easily accessible, and the increase in the region's population generated an internal market for new products. By 1920 the industrial output of the city of Sao Paulo had surpassed that of Rio. In the wake of the Great Depression the city experienced its second major industrial growth spurt. The dictatorial regime of President Getulio Vargas sought to make Brazil more self-sufficient and less dependent on imported goods by prioritizing industrialization. Sao Paulo, with its abundant supply of skilled and semi-skilled labor, took advantage of the added energy made available by the construction of several new hydroelectric facilities on its outskirts. By 1940 factories in the metropolitan area were churning out 43% of Brazil's entire industrial production. The next burst of industrial expansion came with the presidency of Juscelino Kubitschek. Metropolitan Sao Paulo played a leading role. In 1957 Volkswagen founded Brazil's first automobile assembly plant in the town of São Bernardo do Campo, 13 miles from São Paulo. Before long, the ABC suburbs, Santo André, São Bernardo do Campo, and São Caetano do Sul, could boast of harboring Latin America's largest automotive industry. The heady years of the Brazilian miracle marked yet another stage in the explosive burgeoning of São Paulo. Success bred success, as the area attracted foreign investment that facilitated the construction of new industrial plants. Sao Paulo by now was the fastest growing city in the world. 
it had become the most powerful commercial and financial center in the Western Hemisphere, outside of the United States. The city and its environs, along with the manufacturing enterprises that gave the region its economic muscle, expanded in a very Brazilian way, with great optimism, exuberance, and spontaneity. There was no serious long-range planning to take into account the environmental impact of the region's growth. The hard-working Paulistas were so bent on charging ahead into the future that they failed to pause and consider what kind of future they were bringing upon themselves. Abusing Nature's Bounty 285. In the 1960s it was already becoming evident that the city was suffering from both air and water pollution. The two major rivers of the region had become sewage canals, and industrial chimneys were emitting dark smoke that at times made breathing difficult and reduced visibility. But most people accepted these circumstances as a price of progress. By the 1970s, however, the quality of Greater Sao Paulo's atmosphere had worsened to a point where public anxiety began to displace acquiescence. A 1973 government report found that the air in the ABC suburbs, where some 750,000 people lived, contained so much sulfur dioxide that it was unbreathable. Moreover, since this huge industrial park was located south and east of Sao Paulo, the prevailing winds often pushed its pollutants in the direction of the capital, providing yet another example of the bitter fruits of unplanned growth. Smog generated by tens of thousands of factories in and around the city, more than a million motor vehicles, three garbage incinerators, and a thermoelectric plant was especially troublesome during the winter months, when temperature inversions trapped foul air over the city. Within the city, air pollution affected the breathing of all citizens, rich and poor alike, but people living in substandard housing, and especially children, suffered from higher rates of respiratory illnesses. In 1973 a well-known artist generated widespread publicity when he appeared in public with an oxygen mask strapped to his face. Two years later, a Gallup poll indicated that 82% of the people of Greater Sao Paulo considered the air pollution very serious. Moreover, the flood of migrants into Sao Paulo and its suburbs increased the dumping of non-treated sewage into nearby rivers and streams, which were already contaminated by industrial waste from factories. Scientists suspected that this added pollution, in turn, was contributing to the high rate of infant mortality in the slum areas of the city and its environs. As Sao Paulo grew, the quality of life in the megalopolis kept deteriorating. The amount of open, green space, public parks, plazas, and so on, per inhabitant dropped to less than one-third of the amount generally recommended for urban areas. This deficiency helped produce the heat island effect, a phenomenon that the Brazilians causes sharp increases in temperature as much as 10 degrees Celsius in isolated areas of the city. The heat from these islands can cause severe discomfort and even intestinal diseases, it can also generate sudden, heavy rains that produce flooding. The pollution problems afflicting Sao Paulo were but one part of a larger situation that forced Brazil's military regime to back away from the development at any cost rhetoric it had used at the 1972 United Nations Conference in Stockholm. Mainly addressing the need to rationalize the exploitation of the country's natural resources, the federal government created an environmental protection agency within the Ministry of the Interior. This was another example of the para inglês vs syndrome, because the agency was woefully underfunded and had limited authority. State governments were still elected by popular vote during this period, and although the military placed limits on the democratic process, voters could still make their concerns felt on a number of issues. As public apprehension about pollution mounted, Sao Paulo politicians found it prudent to address the issue, and as a result, on the state level a number of environmental protection initiatives were launched. In 1973 the state took its first important step by creating the Company of Technology for Basic Sanitation and Water Pollution Control, or CETESIB, to use its Portuguese acronym. Attached to the Secretariat of Public Works, CETESIB was a corporate entity operating as both a regulator and a consultant to industry asterisk CETESIB was granted legal authority to establish sanitation standards for the public water supply and to set emission standards governing air pollution. 
It also monitored polluting activities and granted licenses for enterprises that might cause environmental damage. Setesib found it easier to require new industries to install emissions controls than to force existing plants to take pollution abatement measures. The costs of abatement were often substantial, and businessmen were hesitant to incur them without. Asterisk the latter role is troublesome, since an enterprise's compliance with advice from Setesib makes it difficult for the agency to take subsequent regulatory action against that client. Abusing Nature's Bounty 287. Public Subsidies Using its authority to levy fines and penalties, Setesib concentrated on lowering industrial emissions of particulates and sulfur dioxide, which came from a relatively small percentage of the area's factories, and achieved some degree of success. However, the number of motor vehicles in Greater Sao Paulo has passed the 4 million mark, and they now cause some 90% of the city's air pollution. Cars, trucks, and buses dump 5,000 tons of carbon monoxide into the atmosphere each day, and breathing in Sao Paulo remains less than salubrious. Regulation of auto emissions is considered a matter for the federal government, and the cost of cutting down emission rates in both new and old vehicles would be substantial. Setesib is also struggling with the problem of water pollution. The need to construct new sewage treatment facilities has reached a critical stage, and it remains to be seen whether the state of Sao Paulo can find the financial resources necessary for funding these projects. Meanwhile, the internal migration to the periphery of the capital continues, and the new arrivals build more privies and dig more wells. Disease-laden waste from the privies can seep into underground streams and from there into the wells. As one scientist has noted, there is a sanitation bomb around Sao Paulo, waiting to detonate. If there is one dramatic success story to which Setesib can point, it is the recovery of Cuba while some environmental protection officials have suggested privately that the original uproar over the Valley of Death might have been somewhat exaggerated, it is beyond cavil that Cubatao had become both a national and an international symbol of ecological devastation. This awareness created a political climate that enabled Setesib to mount an aggressive program designed to place limitations on the amount of pollutants emanating from the city's industrial plants. Between 1983 and 1990 Setesib identified 230 sources of pollution and brought 206 of them under control. These measures sharply reduced the levels of air and water pollution. Over this period industry spent $450 million on pollution abatement, and the government levied $2.5 million in fines against recalcitrant pollut. ERS The Brazilians the air in downtown Cubatao is now better than that in some parts of Sao Paulo. Fish have returned to the region's streams. The foul odors that used to permeate the city on a daily basis are now a problem about every four months. Vila Parisi is but a memory, having been torn down to make room for a truck terminal. In 1989 helicopters sprayed two tons of seed bombs, gelatine balls containing seeds of 25 plant species, on the nearby slopes in an effort to regenerate vegetation. Cubatao is not a paradise by any means, a Setesib engineer remarked in 1992. We are not euphoric. There are still many problems here. The toxic diseases brought on by past exposures to the pollution in Cubatao continue to afflict many among the city's residents. On the other hand, as the engineer pointed out in the same interview, the city has an unusually high proportion of track and field athletes who do well in state competitions a remarkable tribute to the adaptability and toughness of the human species asterisk. Although elements of Brazilianness bear some responsibility for the violence wreaked on the environment in parts of Brazil, the burgeoning of a grassroots environmental movement stirs hope that public concern will nudge indifference aside, and that the wanton destruction of the country's natural endowments will soon cease. Citizens are becoming increasingly aware of the high costs of ecological degradation, having learned from the media about the effects of pollution on both urban and rural life, disasters like Cubatao, and the international controversy over Brazil's exploitation of the Amazon basin, a subject explored in detail in Chapter 12. Attitudes toward the environment are definitely in transition further evidence of the evolving essence of national character. 
The roots of the environmental movement go back to 1958 and the creation of the Brazilian Foundation for the Conservation of Nature. This was a private group, composed of agronomists, botanists, and ecologists who were concerned at the developmental. Asterisk in the 1985 Rio de Janeiro Marathon, one of the finishers wore a Cubatao t-shirt. This had to be either sardonic social commentary or a remarkable physiological feat. Abusing Nature's Bounty 289 Is policies the government was pushing would cause serious damage to the natural environment. It operated in a discreet, genteel way to educate Brazilians about the need for conservation, and to persuade public officials to pay some heed to the preservation of Brazil's forests, rivers, and animal life. As the historical record demonstrates, the foundation was a voice crying in the wilderness. The first aggressively activist environmental organization came into being in 1971 in Rio Grande do Sul. A prime mover of the Gaucho Association for the Protection of the Natural Environment, Agapan, was José Lutzenberger, an indefatigable, freewheeling, somewhat eccentric scientist who once worked for the pesticide industry but left because he felt he was prostituting himself. As Brazil made the transition to democracy in the early 1980s, more environmental groups came into being. Fabio Feldman, the founder of the Union of Defenders of the Land, Oikos, became the first politician to be elected to the Congress by campaigning on environmental issues. With his influence a green political party came into being. Conservationists began to make use of an unusual feature of Brazilian law, the AGO Popular, or Popular Action, which enables citizens to bring suits against government agencies or officials for failing to protect the public patrimony. The new constitution of 1988 contained an article that began by assuring every citizen the right to an ecologically balanced environment, and charged the government with preserving the environment for future generations. The article went on to impose a number of specific duties on the executive branch. Of course, these are aspirations rather than enforceable obligations, but their very presence in the nation's Magna Carta has to be considered a major triumph for the environmental movement. The notoriety Cubatao generated in the early 1980s both internally and abroad helped create public awareness of environmental issues within Brazil, but an even more heightened degree of consciousness came into being as a result of an assault on nature that dwarfed what was happening in the Valley of Death. Brazilian efforts to exploit the vast resources of the Amazon basin involved some of the aspects of the national character that contributed to environmental devastation generally, but it also dramatized the clash between the Brazilians, the country's immediate, and enormous, economic needs and the less tangible but equally urgent necessity to preserve one of the Earth's unique ecosystems. The story of the rainforests is a complex one, shedding light on courage, foolishness, persistence, violence, suffering, and greed the story of a dream threatening to become a nightmare and it requires a detailed look. Chapter 12 The Amazon Basin A Case Study of Violence Tihi view from above is one of pillars of grey smoke converging into dark, orange-fringed clouds that hover ominously over the green canopy, rendering cities and settlements invisible, and even causing air traffic to seek alternate routes. At ground level hellish flames hold majestic tree trunks in a serpentine embrace and lick their way up toward the topmost branches to spurt skyward and glow like the fire on a candle wick. The purposeful torching of vast stretches of the tropical forest in the Amazon basin during the 1970s and 1980s was the most visible aspect of extensive ecological violence perpetrated there, and but just one episode in a larger, more general pattern of regional violence that included the extermination of Indians and bloody conflicts over land ownership. At first little heed was paid to the fires, because there seemed to be an inexhaustible expanse of forest for Brazilians to burn. The Amazon basin comprises the north of Brazil, as defined by the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics, and embraces seven states and an area of over 1.3 million square miles, or 42% of the entire country asterisk. Yet by the end of the 1970s, deforestation was provoking intense concern in some quarters. Photographs from satellites circling the Earth produced solid evidence of what had previously been a 
Asterisk Amazonia, another official designation used for administrative purposes, includes this region as well as large, densely forested segments of the states of Mato Grosso and Maranhão. The Brazilians. Matter of speculation, as much as one-tenth of the Brazilian Amazon forest had already been raised. The soil beneath the dense tree cover was turning out to be infertile and highly vulnerable to erosion. There were those who grimly predicted that if the wholesale destruction were allowed to continue unchecked, an area two-thirds that of the continental United States would one day become an immense wasteland perhaps not the Brazilian Sahara that the most pessimistic commentators were projecting, but at the very least a wilderness of scrub. Such a cataclysmic change could have mind-boggling implications. The Amazon basin contains anywhere from 1 to 15 million, or more, species of animal and plant life, according to recent estimates. Within this astonishingly diverse ecosystem may be undiscovered pharmaceutical and genetic treasures of incalculable value, perhaps cures for AIDS and cancer, as some have suggested. Moreover, the burning of the forest was discharging large quantities of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, thereby contributing to what some scientists had identified as a trend toward global warming, the greenhouse effect, that might one day lead to the melting of the polar ice caps and the consequent flooding of coastal regions everywhere. In the 1980s the rate of deforestation kept increasing, especially in western Amazonia. Although there were disagreements about the size of the fires and exactly how much of the rainforest had been destroyed, statistics relating to the Amazon are notoriously inexact, the situation clearly was out of hand. Environmentalists both abroad and inside Brazil, where the movement was still suffering from birth pangs, protested energetically but with little effect. In 1988 two events combined to focus increased worldwide attention on Amazonia. The press coverage of the fires ravaging Yellowstone Park during a particularly dry summer in the United States increased public awareness of the global warming phenomenon. Later that year Chico Mendes, the internationally known leader of Brazilian rubber tappers who were trying to save the rainforest, was shot down in cold blood by assassins in Zapuri, in the state of Acre on the western edge of Amazonia. The murder provoked universal outrage from human rights advocates and from groups and individuals opposed to the senseless destruction of the biological wonderland in northern Brazil. The Amazon Basin 293 The destruction of the Amazon Basin is much more than a threat to animal and plant life, as the death of Chico Mendes suggested. The survival of Brazil's remaining tribal Indians, as well as the intrepid forest people who live by collecting latex and other products from jungle trees, is at stake. Also hanging in the balance is the fate of the hundreds of thousands of poor Brazilians lured into Amazonia by promises of land and work that could never be fulfilled. Yet at the same time Brazil, with its heavy foreign debt, pressing economic and social needs, and dreams of grandeur, can hardly be expected to turn its back on the untapped wealth and hydroelectric potential of the region. Certain aspects of Brazilianness have contributed to the staggering ecological and social problems of Amazonia. These traits include a penchant for grandiose projects, short-sightedness, reliance on good intentions even though they might fly in the face of logic and experience, an extractive mentality, part of the country's heritage as a Portuguese colony, a lack of respect for nature, and a propensity for violence. Ever since the first adventurers made their way inland on the Amazon River and its tributaries in search of South America's legendary city of gold, or El Dorado, the notion that Amazonia was a potential source of hidden wealth, in one form or another, has never left the Brazilian imagination. But the impenetrability of the rainforest, the rigors of the tropical climate, and the ever-present risk of injury or death from disease, insects, snakes, carnivores, and hostile Indian tribes made exploration and settlement of what many called the green hell exceedingly difficult. The rubber boom at the turn of the 19th century brought a brief period of giddy growth to Manaus, Bolem, and other towns along the Amazon, but when Brazil's rubber monopoly ended, Amazonia once again became a backwater, cut off by the vast distances and geographical barriers that separated it from the rest of the country. In 1930 the population of Amazonia had not yet reached 2 million. The number of tribal Indians was steadily diminishing, 
although the sexual unions of Indians and settlers from other parts of the country made the native Brazilian presence felt throughout the region. One subgroup to which Indian blood made an important contribution was the rubber tappers, or seringueiros, the descent. The Brazilians. Dance of Northeasterners who came to the jungles during the rubber boom, as well as more recent migrants who answered the call for rubber soldiers to help the Allied war effort in World War II, when the Japanese cut off the supply of rubber from Malaya. Exploited mercilessly by their bosses during the boom years, the Seringuairos remained in the tropical forest after the rubber market collapsed. Many took Indian women as wives or companions. They survived by working on their own, clearing away small plots for farming, extracting latex from wild rubber trees, and harvesting nuts from jungle trees and plants. It is ironic that the Seringuairos were slaughtering Indians during the height of the rubber boom, an episode that is described in Chapter 3, and afterward they were embracing the ways of the remaining tribe members and learning how to live in harmony with the rainforest. The Seringuairos developed a hybrid culture of their own, neither northeastern nor Indian but with traces of both. Despite the extreme isolation in which they lived, they retained contact with the rest of Brazil by listening to the radio, their only link to the larger society to which they knew they belonged. Although they could neither read nor write and had no access to health care, they managed to lead simple, reasonably decent, reasonably happy lives, at least in comparison with their compatriots who faced grinding poverty in the coastal cities or rural areas of the northeast and south. During the presidency of Jesselino Kubitschek, life began to change in Amazonia. In conjunction with the building of a new capital in the interior, the federal government set out to construct a highway that would link Brasilia to Balem, on the mouth of the Amazon River. This was a critical first step in the integration of Amazonia with the rest of the country. The road would open the way for the colonization of the southeastern sector of the Amazon basin and mark the first step in a process of destructive exploitation asterisk. Asterisk perhaps the forces of nature knew what was coming and resented it. Just before the final segment of the highway was completed, as the engineer in charge of the project napped in a hammock, a strong wind caused a nearby tree to topple on him, and he was killed. The Amazon Basin 295. The fear that if they did not populate Amazonia they would lose it was a key concern motivating the Brazilians push northward. The military governments of the 1960s and 1970s took the view that considerations of national security required the settlement of land adjacent to Brazil's northern and northwestern borders, to create a buffer against the infiltration of subversive elements based in other South American countries. They had in mind, among other things, Che Guevara's ill-fated frolic in Bolivia. There was another, more subtle apprehension lurking in Brazilian minds the notion that foreigners had designs on the natural resources to be found in Amazonia. The prime suspect was Uncle Sam. A long-standing, if seldom openly expressed apprehension was that the United States was going to send African Americans to live in the region, as a prelude to annexation. When the Hudson Institute, an American think tank, proposed the construction of a gigantic dam that would flood much of Amazonia, in order to create a huge source of hydroelectric power as well as to facilitate ship traffic in the region, Brazilians saw this as part of the grand design. By quickly dismissing these concerns as paranoia, we ignore the nationalism and national pride that animated them, and the deeply rooted conviction of Brazilians that if their nation was to achieve its rightful destiny, Brazil itself would have to exploit the natural resources of the Amazon basin. Moreover, it was highly predictable that when foreigners decried the destruction of the rainforest, nationalistic Brazilians would view the protest as part of a conspiracy to keep them from developing, and that they would denounce it as unacceptable intervention in their domestic affairs. The program of road building between Brasilia and Bolem continued after the military seized power in 1964. An even more ambitious scheme sought to connect northeast Brazil with the western Amazon basin, and work began on the Trans-Amazon Highway, which would one day provide an overland route between Recife and the Peruvian border. At the same time the regime launched a program of incentives designed to attract capital to the north. 
companies could invest in Amazonian enterprises the funds they would otherwise have had to pay as taxes to the federal government. There was no require. The Brazilians meant that the new businesses be labor-intensive. Corporations from the south of Brazil as well as multinationals purchased huge tracts of land in the north for the purpose of setting up cattle ranches that would have been unprofitable but for the subsidies that the military government was offering. Plans for the construction of the Trans-Amazon Highway drew major inspiration from the serious drought ravaging the northeast in 1970 and causing backlanders to migrate to coastal cities that were already seriously overcrowded and hard-pressed to provide rudimentary public services. The hope was that the new highway system would relieve this social pressure by encouraging migration to Amazonia. Prior colonization schemes had been unsuccessful because the government had failed to provide migrants with the kind of education and technical support, such as credit that would enable them to purchase farm implements and seeds, they needed to thrive, or at least survive, in a new environment. But experience had taught the authorities nothing, so with typical Brazilian optimism and reliance on improvisation, the regime set out to fulfill the slogan land without people for people without land. Although Amazonia might have been a land without people, it was surely not a land without landowners. Not only were big corporations snatching up huge patches of virgin forest, but speculators were also busy along the new roads. Chronic inflation and the absence of a capital gains tax in Brazil make land speculation an attractive pursuit for the rich and the powerful, and they were quick to take advantage of the opening up of Amazonia. Often relying on fraudulent land titles, and selling the same property to two or more purchasers, they traded briskly or held land in the expectation that it would appreciate in value. Neither the federal nor the state governments had the administrative or law enforcement resources, or the will, to put an end to these fraudulent practices. The result was that when migrants began to arrive and looked for plots to farm the dream of every landless peasant they often discovered to their dismay that they were settling on property claimed by someone with a valid or apparently valid legal title to the premises. This chaos inevitably led to conflicts, often culminating in the loss of life. The social and economic structure of rural Brazil has reflected a concentration of land ownership, wealth, and power in the hands. The Amazon Basin 297. Of an elite that could always count on the civil authorities to protect their interests. Attempts to change the status quo have traditionally provoked violent responses. A 1988 study by Amnesty International found that more than a thousand peasants had been slain since 1980, generally over land disputes, and that reports of violence and killings in the context of land tenure have increased in the last five years, particularly in the eastern Amazon and northeastern Brazil. In remote areas landowners would employ gunmen to threaten, expel, or kill settlers and organizers of rural workers. They could count on the support of all the available local authorities, including the police. The torturing of settlers was not uncommon. Efforts to investigate charges of wrongdoing often foundered because of dilatory tactics or outright obstruction on the part of government officials. The Amnesty International report uncovered only two instances of hired killers being convicted and sentenced, and no instances of an individual accused of committing a murder being brought to justice. Occasionally colonists or workers would fight back, and an owner or hitman would lose his life asterisk the atmosphere resembled the American Wild West. Many squatters opted to move and search for new land or to go to work for some powerful landowner, often under conditions of debt peonage that could scarcely be distinguished from slavery. During the military regime the only effective support for landless peasants in Amazonia came from the Catholic Church. Priests and bishops spoke out for social justice and helped settlers organize to defend their rights. For their efforts they occasionally became the targets of violence, and some paid with their lives. When extreme leftists launched a guerrilla warfare campaign in the early 1970s in the southeastern corner of the Amazon basin a pitiful effort involving some 70 participants with no chance of success the military seized on this as a pretext for clamping down heavily on any manifestations of unrest in the region. Asterisk in 1976 a cattle rancher and his two sons. United States citizens who had settled in Amazonia, were shot down by peasants in a dispute over land. 
the Brazilians. The human violence erupting from struggles over land matched the violence the invaders of Amazonia were perpetrating on the environment. There may be a psychological factor that helps explain this behavior. Because the unknown dangers of the tropical rainforests terrified the early settlers, their descendants may be playing out these fears by destroying as much of the forest as they can. The establishment of new cattle ranches in the region required extensive deforestation, which was accomplished by the use of fire and bulldozers. As highways began to penetrate the tropical forests, squatters cleared the adjacent properties and often pushed deep into the surrounding areas. Eventually, along some stretches of roadway, there were no trees to be seen. The Trans-Amazon Highway cost nearly a billion dollars, increasing the national debt and enriching contractors. But it has never achieved the goals intended by the federal government of providing a link between eastern and western Amazonia, one writer has called it the highway to nowhere, and populating the vastness of the central Amazon basin. The jungle and its adverse weather patterns make the road difficult to traverse. Most of the resettlement projects collapsed because the government failed to furnish settlers with the technical assistance necessary for them to survive in a hostile environment. In addition to attempting to promote a greater human presence in Amazonia, the regime also sought to exploit the natural resources of the region. One of the more highly publicized initiatives was the concession granted to the reclusive American billionaire Daniel Ludwig in 1967. For $3 million he purchased a tract of jungle of more than 5,000 square miles, larger than the area of Austria, on the Yari River, a tributary of the Amazon. His original plan was to harvest lumber, to be derived from groves of fast-growing trees transplanted from Asia. He floated two sections of a wood pulp plant from Japan, where it had been built, across the Indian and Atlantic Oceans on 30-ton barges. The gigantic operation eventually employed over 7,000 workers. The enterprise extended to the production of rice and kaolin, a valuable clay discovered by chance on the property, and the raising of the world's largest herd of water buffalo. The Amazon Basin 299 The Yari Enterprise foundered, as did a smaller scale project undertaken by Henry Ford four decades earlier. The automobile magnate had attempted to create rubber plantations in the Amazon jungle but had failed because of plant diseases that spread among closely planted groves of trees, wild rubber trees are scattered and hence are less susceptible to contagion. So, too, Ludwig's trees and their replacements failed to survive in the thin Amazonian soil, and high costs made growing rice uneconomical. Moreover, during the transition to civilian rule in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the deeply rooted Brazilian paranoia about foreign occupation of Amazonia fed on the excessive secrecy that shrouded the Ludwig operation. There were unfounded rumors that workers were being held as slaves, and that the Yari complex was in reality a U.S. military base. The resulting atmosphere of distrust, combined with the snarl of red tape to which the government subjected Ludwig's enterprise, raised frustration levels far beyond toleration. Having earned nothing on what amounted to a $1 billion investment, Ludwig surrendered and in 1982 sold out to a Brazilian consortium at a substantial loss. The fate of the Yari project demonstrated the awesome power of the Amazon jungle, bureaucracy, and paranoia when they joined forces to bring the world's richest man to his knees. But a second pharaonic enterprise, set in motion as Ludwig was liquidating his Yuri holding, proved that Brazilians on their own were capable of undertaking the taming of Amazonia and taking full advantage of its untold wealth. Carajás, the shorthand expression for a mining operation in the southeastern Amazon basin, promises to yield enormous profits from the export of iron ore, gold, manganese, nickel, copper, and bauxite. But the mining operation has also dramatically illustrated the enormity of the environmental damage that can be inflicted by the flamboyant projects Brazilians delight in launching. In 1967 a young Brazilian geologist working for a Brazilian subsidiary of the U.S. Steel Corporation was copiloting a company helicopter that set down by chance on a bare hilltop in the Serra dos Carajás, remote highlands situated in the jungle south and east of Balem. He was astonished to discover he was perched on a bed of solid iron ore. It turned out to be the world's largest concentra. 
the Brazilians. Shin of high-grade iron ore, estimated to contain 18 billion tons of 66% pure iron compound. Indeed, the entire region, covering an area larger than the state of California, was found to be a vast treasure trove of minerals. Because of the magnitude of the capital investment that would be required to exploit what came to be known as Grand Carajás, the Brazilians had to move with caution. At first U.S. Steel entered into a joint venture with the Vale do Rio Doce Company, or CVRD, a state-owned mining company. In 1977 the Brazilians dissolved the relationship and bought out the Americans. By 1980 they had drawn up their own plans for the development of Grand Carajás, and the project was typically monumental. Pressure to pay off their foreign debt, which was approaching $80 billion, and to underwrite oil imports motivated Brazilians to undertake the Grand Carajás program, which they hoped would greatly increase export earnings. In addition, the project was meant to stimulate new industry and agricultural production as well as create new jobs in the region, all of which they hoped would begin to alleviate the nation's internal social and economic problems. The centerpiece of Carajás was an ambitious operation at the site of the 1967 discovery, where the CVRD dug an open pit mine and installed ore processing facilities. The government constructed a 550-mile railway line linking the mine with docks just south of São Luís, the capital of the state of Maranhão, where an ore-loading terminal and other deep-water port facilities were built. In Tucurif on the Tocantins River 150 miles from Carajás, an enormous hydroelectric dam and power plant were built to send electricity to the mine and other industrial enterprises to be located in the vicinity. A number of other dams were planned. They would supply energy to various other mining and industrial projects, including a chain of pig iron smelters to be set up along the railroad line. Finally, the project called for the encouragement in the immediate area of farming, cattle raising, and forestry enterprises that would provide food and other products for domestic consumption as well as work and land for settlers. The Grand Carajás program required a massive commitment of capital. Indeed, one observer has called it the world's most expensive mining-based project. More than half the $3.5 billion. The Amazon Basin. 301. Spent by the CVRD between 1985 and 1987 came from Japan, Western Europe and the World Bank. Foreign financing of the project evoked the usual outcry from Brazilian nationalists quick to denounce the surrender of Amazonia to multinational corporations. Less vocal but equally urgent protests originated from ecologists who were alarmed at the damage that aspects of the program could potentially inflict on the environment. They expressed particular anxiety about the projected pig iron smelters. Subsequent events have validated many of their concerns. The Carajás iron mine itself, under the ownership of the CVRD, has in fact been a model operation from the ecological perspective. Sensitive to criticisms from abroad about the despoliation of Amazonia, the state company spent $54 million on studying and implementing environmental conservation plans between 1981 and 1985. The settlement of the area around the mine has been well organized and orderly, and damage has been confined to the unavoidable effects of a large-scale mining operation. But planners apparently assumed that the other components of the Grand Carajás project did not need the type of controls that were being enforced at the mine. They undoubtedly hoped that the massive development they were triggering would not do more harm than good, exhibiting the typically Brazilian attitude that if one hopes with sufficient fervor, things will turn out well. Reality, however, often finds a way of obtruding on the best of intentions. The pig iron smelters furnish a perfect example. Tax incentives were devised to encourage the location of smelters in the region, and licenses were granted to 22 of them. The only way they would be able to compete on the world market was by using cheap, readily available fuel charcoal obtained from wood. The hope was that the new enterprises would at some point obtain half their fuel needs from eucalyptus plantations they would create or from trees cultivated through sustainable forest management practices. But there was no way to force these methods on the smelter owners, who would naturally opt to maximize their short-term profits. As some critics had predicted, 
the first two pig iron operations to come online cut down trees with abandon, triggering extensive deforestation, because this was the cheapest way to fuel. The Brazilians. Their smelters, especially after the world price of pig iron fell. What began to happen along the Carajás São Luís railway was an exact repeat of what had previously occurred in Minas Gerais, their pig iron production had destroyed almost two-thirds of the forests in the state. The method the smelters used to obtain cheap fuel for their furnaces appeared to violate the terms of a World Bank loan granted to the CVRD for its Carajás project, which stipulated the observation of measures to protect the environment. But swell as the trapped motorists tolerate with surprising equanimity in the spirit of the season. Exhibitionism, a natural outgrowth of the karaoke's fixation on physical appearance, bubbles irrepressibly to the surface, most noticeably at gala balls in social clubs and night spots, where the city's beautiful people mix with local as well as international celebrities and display their bodies with or without the help of dazzling costumes. At all levels of society cross-dressing has long been a popular practice during carnival. Heterosexual men do not hesitate to parade about in feminine attire that has in many instances been made. The Brazilians. For them by their wives. Even young boys customarily disguise themselves as girls. For avowed transvestites. <laughs>